Okay, so good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Hope you are all doing well and staying safe. I am Maryam Shreif, a senior petroleum engineering student at the Lebanese American University, and I'll be moderating today's session. So on behalf of Peo Petro, SP Egypt section, and Arab Ola Gaz Academy, I am pleasured to warmly welcome you all to the first session of our online course, an overview of multi-stage completions for hydraulic fracturing, which will be presented by a distinguished speaker. So I advise you to take full advantage of his participation and give your full attention to his informative session today in order to widen your knowledge and be able to identify different types of multi-stage completions along with the benefits and considerations of each me methods and so on. Without delay, let me introduce our special guest speaker for today, Engineer Adam Barton. Uh, Engineer Barton's career has been focused on the completion of shales and similar unconventional plays that require multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. In 2015, Engineer Barton started the unconventional oil and gas training, U UOCT, a company specializing in training and consulting for unconventional multi-stage multi completions. The UOGT provides in-house and video-on-demand training courses and performs projects, including market studies, uh, due diligence reports on specific tool segments and other projects. He also remains an active instructor and participant in the industry. So please join me in welcoming Engineer Barton. So we are pleasured to have you with us today. And on a final note, if you have any question related to the technical content of the presentation, please feel free to drop it down in the Q&A section. And we will sure try to answer as, as many questions as possible. Now, a quick reminder before we proceed with the session, please don't forget to join the Google uh, Classroom for this course and do uh, the required quizzes as soon as possible. You can't skip more than one quiz and you should uh, get up about 70% on each quiz in order to get your certificate. I will explain this uh, at the end of this, this session. Now, hope you all enjoy this session. And Engineer Barton, the mic is yours. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Ahmed. And thank you for everyone that's organizing this, uh, this great initiative here. Uh, you know, I know things are really strange right now in the world with the pandemic. Uh, we're limited on travel. We're limited on uh, things like that. So it's great to still be able to connect worldwide with students and, uh, and share knowledge uh, in, our, in our industry. So uh, I won't go into much detail about myself. Uh, Miriam covered that pretty well. Uh, just one thing I will throw out though, um, you can check out my website, uog.training. And you can find my video blog and other free training courses there as well. So in today's uh, module, the first one, we're going to talk about unconventional reservoirs and also uh, introduction to hydraulic fracturing. So when we're talking unconventional reservoirs, uh, especially if you're talking about people in North America, they oftentimes use the slang terminology of shales. Uh, so you'll hear uh, people refer to them as shale plays and things like that. In my opinion, that's really more of a slang terminology that's being used to really kind of capture generically uh, these unconventional reservoirs. And the reason I say that is because um, shale really is, is a type of rock. So this is a, the definition from geology.com, and, and I won't read it to you, especially you petroleum engineers, you probably can define it better than I can. Uh, but my point here is it's a, a certain type of rock and uh, it really doesn't have, it, it can have something to do with unconventionals, but it doesn't have to be unconventionals. So, so what are people referring to when they talk about these shale plays or these unconventional reservoirs? They're talking about a low permeability formation. It's a consolidated formation. So typically sand control is not required. And it can be shales, but it can also be sandstones, carbonate, or other formations, uh, shaley dolomites, um, different types of uh, reservoirs as well. And really what they're talking about at the end of the day is it's a reservoir that requires multi-stage hydraulic fracturing to be able to produce at economical rates. And in a lot of cases, you're also looking at horizontal wells uh, for, that to be for that to occur as well. And, and we'll talk about why that's not necessarily always a requirement, but in most cases a requirement. So what makes them unconventional? <clears throat> These reservoirs don't have enough permeability to economically produce the well. So we're going in there and creating the artificial permeability, also known as conductivity. 
Now, we've, there's really been three keys to unlocking these unconventional reservoirs. Horizontal wells, like I said, not always required, but at least uh, the developments that we've seen around the world, in most cases, they are required nowadays. Hydraulic fracturing, and also the multi-stage completion. So it's not just hydraulic fracturing, it's hydraulic fracturing through multi-stage completions. So the main objective with these types of reservoirs is increasing your reservoir contact area. So we've got our, our target reservoir. And just to kind of give you a reference, uh, if you look at the US specifically, uh, most of these reservoirs range anywhere from 10 to 20 feet thick up to about 500 is the most you'll see in the US. So theoretically, you can put a vertical well in that target reservoir and produce through it. But let's just call it on the higher end. Let's just say this is a 500 foot thick reservoir. Now you can drill a 500 foot vertical well and get that contact area, or you could drill it horizontally and really significantly increase the contact area. Uh, you know, 500 foot vertical well versus a 5,000, 10,000, maybe even 15,000 foot horizontal well and you can really significantly increase the contact. And it's the same with multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. You can place uh, multi-stage hydraulic fractures in that vertical well, and you do increase the contact area just outside of that 500 feet. But now if you take that, let's just call it a 10,000 foot well, and you place 40, 50, 60 stages in it, now you've really started to increase the contact area that you're producing through outside of that well. Now, in the example I was talking about earlier, in the U.S., typically you're limited to about 500 feet thick. But if you go into some international markets, that are, there's a lot thicker pay zones. Uh, for example, the Vaca Marta in Argentina, in certain sections of it, there, it can be up to 5,000 feet thick. However, um, you know, the initial thought was they could do a, a vertical well development, uh, drill the wells a lot easier, drill them a lot faster, cheaper, but what they ended up finding out, or at least my sources in Argentina um, have told me, is that due to the different rock properties, due to the different bedding planes, uh, they actually need to find like rock within that 5,000 feet and then drill horizontally as well. So, so even as it stands today, the, even the thicker plays throughout the world, they're discovering that they really have to have the horizontal wells to really fully uh, develop these, these types of reservoirs economically. So we'll zoom in here and look at fracture treatment objectives. If you're not super familiar with the, uh, the tools and the downhole process, don't worry too much about it right now because we're going to cover that in the next three days. So what we have, what we're looking at here, the light gray, this is going to be our casing string. So this is going to be steel pipe. Uh, the dark gray is going to be cement isolating from the target reservoir in the brown. And so we've, we've isolated it and we've also placed a perforation uh, in the well bore. So we perforated through the casing, through the cement, and into that target reservoir. So now we have the ability to pump into that reservoir. Once we do that, we're going to pump fluid and prop it down the well. The pressure will create a fracture. And then we're going to place fluid and prop it into that fracture to hold it open. Now, if we zoom in a little bit further to look at an individual fracture growing, as we apply the pressure, we're going to create the fracture, and we're going to lead in with what's called a pad fluid. So this is just going to be clean fluid. And the primary purpose here is to initiate the fracture and then start growing the fracture. Once you've created the fracture, then you're going to switch to the slurry. So you're going to put prop and end that fluid. You're going to pump it down hole. And then once you've uh, pumped your slurry, once you've finished your frag job, then you're going to uh, bleed off the pressure. And the purpose of the prop end is that it holds the, the formation open. So once you bleed off the pressure, the formation is going to try to close on itself, but the prop and holds it open and keeps it uh, in play. <clears throat> now, once uh, the formation's closed, once the prop and has hold, held that fracture open, that's our artificial permeability that we've created, the conductivity. So now we can produce our hydrocarbon through the fracture that we've created. So if we look at the, the bigger picture of the hydraulic fracture treatment objectives, we're creating that conductivity uh, so that we can produce the hydrocarbons. Uh, and there's, it just really depends on the play as to what, uh, if we're creating new fractures or reopening natural fractures that have been blocked off by a calcite or something. 
And then we're going to hold the propent, <clears throat> excuse me, install the propent to hold open the fluid flow path. And once again, our main objective here is to create as much reservoir contact area away at, as we can away from the near well bore. And we're going to do that by drilling the well in the direction where we'll grow transverse fractures from the well bore instead of like some conventional applications where we target longitudinal fractures. And then we're going to fracture at a high pressure, uh, high rate and a high and uh, volume. So these are going to be significantly larger frac jobs in most cases than a lot of the conventional assets that we see uh, in the conventional reservoirs. So your primary components of hydraulic fracturing uh, is going to be your propent. As we saw, it holds the formation open after you've created the fracture. Your fluid is going to create the fracture. And then uh, one of the most key aspects of the fluid is it transports the propent into the fracture. Additives, we won't focus a lot of time on additives, uh, but these are going to be the additional fluids and chemicals that are going to be specific to each well and or the formation. And then of course your surface equipment. So that's going to be everything used on surface to execute the frag job that you've designed. So we'll look here um, at some images of some propping. So this is uh, on the far left here. We've got our, our natural sands. So we've got our Ottawa white sands on the upper left and then brown frac sands on the uh, bottom left. Now you can see here, these are natural sands. They're, they're mined uh, from the earth and you can see they have an erratic shape to them. So they're not perfectly spherical. Um, and, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. In the middle upper here, we have our ultra lightweight propent. So this is going to be a man-made propent. And it's going, the purpose of these is going to be a very light propent and it suspends or even floats in water. <laughs> so that uh, fluid transport is not as much of an issue. Now you can see here, because it is man-made, it is spherical. In the bottom middle, we have our resin coated sand. So it's the same natural sands we see here, but now we have the resin coating on the sand. So, so that resin will add a few different benefits uh, to the sand itself. In the um, uh, far right here, we have our, our ceramics. So up in the top, we have low density ceramic. So this is a little bit lighter weight, uh, man-made ceramic propens. You can see it's a lot more spherical shape than we have on the sands over here. And then on the bottom right, we have our center of bauxite. So this is going to be a very heavy and a very strong ceramic propent. Um, and, and as you can see, the spherical shape, it's also the ceramic made, uh, man-made propens. So dig into the types of propent a little bit. The, uh, the first is the natural sands. So it's, it's mined from the earth. Uh, you run it through a sieve to determine the size. And the benefits, it's cheap. Um, and, and cheap is always a very relative term in oil and gas industry. Uh, but just because of the different logistics for the different regions, things like that. But typically speaking, sand is cheaper than ceramic propens. Uh, readily available, uh, and that also depends on the size. And it also depends on, once again, just the logistics overall. So if you look at a lot of the mature plays in the U.S., uh, nowadays you see local sand mines popping up. So if you look at the Permian out in uh, Texas and New Mexico, in a lot of cases there's a sand mine where they, they mine the sand directly uh, from the earth very near the wells. So in, in a lot of cases the sand is mined about a, within an hour of the well sites. And uh, you also have naturally lower profit migration because of that erratic shape of the sand. Now the considerations, uh, it's lower strength. Uh, you know, it, it just depends on where you mine it from as to how strong the propane is or how strong the sand is. And also that erratic shape. That erratic shape can cause the, the propane to bunch up and take away from your uh, conductivity. Now the, uh, the ceramic propens, uh, the benefits, you have a consistent spherical shape which means that you get a theoretically better conductivity. You also have a higher strength. And, um, and both of those aspects give you the better conductivity. And we'll look at some of the propent failure methods uh, here in a minute. Now the consideration is uh, value. So the, the ceramic propens are more expensive than the natural sands uh, in most cases. So you have to be able to justify the increased price of those ceramics versus production benefits. So you have to be able to 
pay for the additional cost uh, with your increased reduction. Also, availability can be an issue. Once again, depending on the timing, um, as it stands right now, there's probably a lot of warehouses in the US that have a lot of ceramic profits. So depending on which size you want, availability may not be as much of an issue. And then profit migration, because that spherical shape uh, tends to um, have profit migration more frequently. So this is what I'm talking about with the irregular shaped versus the spherical shape with the natural sands and the, um, uh, the ceramics. So you can see just because of the, uh, the irregular shape here, the sand just kind of fits into each other uh, however it, it, it falls. So that theoretically takes away from your conductivity just because the poor, um, <clears throat> the flow path through the propent pack is reduced because of that irregular shape. Whereas the spherical propent has a lot more pore space and uh, conductivity through it. But the, uh, the shape of the sand, uh, this irregular shape here of the sand actually creates friction, which means that it, it mitigates, it helps mitigate profit migration after the frag job's over. Whereas this smooth spherical shape, you know, as your pressure cycle, um, the, um, the spherical shape can tend to act like ball bearings and have uh, increased your chances of uh, prop and flow back and migration. And then the, the other type of propent we talked about is the resin coated propent. So uh, this can be sand or ceramic propents. Uh, either one can be resin coated. The benefits of adding that resin coating is it adds individual strength, or excuse me, adds strength to the individual grain of sand. So it makes the overall sand stronger. And it also bonds the prop and pack together. So it helps distribute the load and makes the overall prop and pack stronger too. And because it bonds together, it does also help reduce prop and rearrangement and migration. So <clears throat> if you see ceramic propents that are resin coated, that's what they're actually targeting because the ceramic propents are much stronger than the sands. So in most cases, it's, it's not going to be trying to add strength to the individual ceramic propent. It's going to be trying to reduce the propent rearrangement and migration by bonding the propent pack together. The considerations, uh, just like the ceramic propens, value. You have to outweigh, or you have to weigh out the uh, price of the additional resin coating versus any kind of production benefits. So you have to justify the additional cost by increasing your production in order to uh, make it economically viable. And uh, also there are questions about maintaining conductivity. Um, as far as I can tell, this is one of those things where it's, it's a little bit outdated. Um, uh, when, some, when resin coatings first came out, there were some issues with them coming off the propent. Uh, and there was always a question of whether it would form together and block off conductivity. Uh, the technology has improved significantly over the last several years. And um, uh, at least the, uh, the resin coating manufacturers do believe that they've solved a lot of the issues that they used to have five to 10 years ago. So this is what I was talking about with the um, uh, bonding the prop and pack together because each of, now with that resin coating, once it gets down to all, once it gets to temperature, now all of the, the, the resin coating bonds together all of the propent and now that helps distribute the load over the prop and pack and bond it together. So that means that you have the higher strength prop and pack. It helps prevent the propent rearrangement because it's bonded together and it helps minimize near wellbore propent migration back into the wellbore. So the way we measure propent and talk about propent sizing is mesh size. And it can be a little bit um, counterintuitive because the, the smaller the mesh size, the larger the propent is. is. So when you hear people talk about propent, they're going to be referring to a range of propent. So um, one of the more common ones, um, especially several years ago, was a 2040 propent. And what that means is that the sand is ran through a 20 mesh sieve and a 40 mesh sieve. So that means that um, there's not any propent grains larger than the 20 mesh, which is 0.841 millimeters and there's not any smaller than the 40 mesh, which is 0 0.400 millimeters. So it's a range of propent. And now if we want smaller propent, uh, another one that used to be relatively common was a 4070. 
So with the 4070, it, the maximum size is the 40 mesh, that 0 0.04, or excuse me, 0 0.40 uh, millimeter, and the 70 mesh, which is 0 0.21 millimeters. So a 2040 sand is actually larger than a 4070 sand. And now just to kind of give you an idea of what the uh, mesh size is based off of is, is the number of holes per square inch. So, um, so 40 mesh would mean that there's 40 holes over a square inch on that sieve. So that's what helps determine the size. So other uh, considerations with the prop and is you have to be able to get it down hole. You have to be able to pump it at surface, get it through that horizontal lateral and, um, and actually get it into the fracture. So, um, so this chart here is from Sun Specialty Products and this is uh, based on Stokes equation. And what you really need to know about Stokes equation is that the heavier the propent and the larger the diameter of the propent, the faster that it will sink in static water. So this is uh, some of the testing that Sun did. Uh, the Frack Black HT, this is some of their uh, ultra lightweight propent. So you can see the smaller size, the 3080 mesh, uh, it virtually doesn't sink in static water. So it, it either floats or suspends itself in static water. If you go up to a little bit larger diameter, the 1430, you can see it starts slowly sinking in water, but it's not at a very fast pace. And if you compare, compare these ultra lightweight propents to 100 mesh sand, which uh, at least in the US has become a very common uh, sand, uh, uh, sand type and size, uh, you can see both of these fall a lot less faster uh, <clears throat> in static water than the ultra lightweight propents. And then if you go up the well or up this chart, you can see that uh, the 4070 mesh sand, which is a little bit larger diameter, it falls at a higher rate. And then if you stay, stick with the sand, the 2040 sand, which is a little bit higher, it falls even faster. And then you have your bauxites, which are your heavy duty ceramics. So a smaller bauxite falls relatively quickly, but then a 2040 larger diameter falls even faster. So like I said, really what you need to take from this uh, chart and from Stokes uh, settling velocity in static water is that the larger the diameter and the heavier the propent, the faster it's going to sink. So some of the uh, issues that we have to be careful with with uh, propent and when selecting it is um, the first one we'll look at is propent crushing. So in this case here, as we uh, have our propent back in, if the, the stresses in the formation are too high, um, then the propent can actually crush. So initially we planned our design to have this width on our conductivity, but if the propent's not strong enough and it breaks into pieces, now we start losing conductivity because we've lost fracture width because that propent is crushed. Now, if this is natural sands, another problem presents itself because now we have sand fines. So not only are we taking away from our fracture width, we're also adding those sand fines, which will help clog up uh, the pore space and help further reduce conductivity as well. So that's why you have to consider prop and strength in these reservoirs. Another scenario is prop and embedment. So once again, we have our fracture width here. Uh, this is what we're planning on producing through. But in this case, the formation is too soft and it actually embeds around the propent. So the problem with this is we're losing our fracture width and in turn losing uh, conductivity. So this is going to be more prone in a clay rich type of formation just because the propent is holding, but the, um, the formation is too soft and will sink in on the propent. And then we also have the propent rearrangement. So initially we have this frac width here uh, as over time, as we cycle our pressures, we expand the formation or the fracture width, we uh, then bleed off the pressure, and then the propent starts shifting because we've applied pressure. So we may shut down, shut in the well uh, to um, do any kind of RNS work, uh, artificial lift work, anything like that. And when the pressure builds back up, it'll allow that propent to rearrange. And now once again, we're taking away conductivity by taking away our uh, fracture width. Now we also have to determine how much propent we put into the uh, well, uh, fracture. So generally speaking, um, or, or the, the general rule of thumb is the, the more propent you put in the well, the higher the conductivity. 
but you also have to be very careful because if you pump too much propent, uh, then what will happen is it can't physically get into that fracture and therefore it, it, it bridges off and can cause a screen out. So with a screen out, there's a variety of different ways that it, or why it can happen. Uh, it could be that the fracture is growing upwards and then it takes a sharp 90 degree turn. Uh, and in a lot of cases, I think it's the fact of we assume that our fracture width is going to be one thing and it turns out to be different. So here, <clears throat> we assume that our fracture width is going to be this. But in reality, once the fracture starts growing in the formation, we have a significantly less width uh, with that fracture. But we've planned our propent concentration around this width. So what happens is when we start pumping our fluid in our slurry, um, then the propent cannot physically fit into this fracture width here that's actually created and then it starts piling up and bridging off. So the first thing that'll happen, you'll see a pressure spike because you're gonna have fluid leak off because some of the fluid can still pass through that propent, but then over time, if it continues to persist and there's not another flow path, then the propent will continue backing up. It'll back up into the wellbore itself and you can no longer physically pump into the wellbore because um, you, you have too much propent in there. So, um, you know, this is another very important way to distinguish um, or uh, difference, I should say, with conventional versus unconventional, because in a lot of conventional reservoirs, especially if there's sand control involved, the objective is actually a screen out. Whereas in these types of reservoirs, uh, a screen out is a very bad thing. You're having to shut down your frack job, do a, a intervention work, and then move on to the next stage. So it's actually non-productive time in these applications. <clears throat> now another consideration is the frac fluid. So, um, so one of the more common types of frac fluids out there is slick water. And when you hear people talk about slick water, it really can mean a lot of different things, but most commonly it's just fresh water mixed with friction reduce and any other additives needed for the well bore. Now with slick water, it's a very low viscosity, typically two to three centipoise. Another uh, frac fluid option is linear gels. So with these, it's gonna be water, a gelling agent like a guar, and any other additives that are needed for the well. And that's gonna have a medium viscosity, 10 to 30 centipoise. And then you have cross-link gels. So that's going to be water, a gelling agent like that guar, a cross-linker like a boron or a titanium, and whatever other additives are, are needed for the well. And with the cross-link gels, it's a very, very high viscosity, typically 100 to 1,000 centipoise. So if you, um, a lot of operators, like I said, slick water can be a lot of different things. A lot of times you will hear them use slick water and linear gels um, interchangeably. And I think a lot of the reason is be just because of what we saw here, uh, the centipoise is not significantly higher on the slick water versus the linear gels. So in most cases, at least what I've seen, uh, operators will refer to linear gels as a slick water frac treatment. So here we're going to combine slick water and linear gels because they're very, very similar as far as the um, prop and transport uh, capabilities. So the benefits of these systems, overall they're operationally simple. It uh, gives you quick fluid recovery, a cheap, uh, once again, relative term uh, in our industry, depending on your logistics, your region, things like that. But the consideration uh, for these <clears throat> is the, it's all about the low viscosity uh, because you don't have enough viscosity uh, to really uh, transport the propent. So you're almost purely relying on turbulent flow for propent transport into the well. It also uh, cannot transport the heavier propent and it also can't transport high uh, concentration of the propent. And because you're pumping at such high rates, uh, it can wear on your pumping equipment uh, really quickly as well. Now the cross-link gels, this is a, a very, very viscous fluid. You can see the, uh, the picture uh, from a Baker Hughes source here. So it's, it's a very thick uh, gel. You can actually pick it up with your hand and all of these brown spots in this gel, that's propent. So it actually suspends the propent in the gel. 
So the benefits is it has fantastic uh, prop and transportation because it suspends the prop and in the gel. It's, uh, you can use the heavier propent, you can use larger propents, and um, you're not really relying, uh, or you're not purely relying on turbulent flow to be able to transport the propent. So it's much easier on the pumping equipment because you're pumping at lower rates. But there's a couple of things to consider. It does require breakers after the frack job. As you can imagine, uh, you don't want to leave this viscous fluid in the well bore uh, for production. And a lot of the, um, the newer cross links can actually be broken down uh, with just temperature in the well bore. So it just depends on what type of cross link, <clears throat> what type of cross link gels you're using as to how you can break them down. You could also have damage from fluid residuals. So if you don't properly break down and remove that gel, uh, that can create some damage that you have to overcome in production. And uh, you could have difficulty recovering the fluids if it's not broken down properly as well. So like I said earlier, we won't focus a lot on additives um, <clears throat> just because it's, it's very specific to the well, to the fluid system, everything else. Uh, but this is a uh, chart from PetroWiki. Uh, that's a pretty good um, overall breakdown of the, the more common additives used. Uh, so you have biocides, which kills bacteria, uh, clay stabilizer, which prevents clay swelling. Uh, for example, a lot of the work I did in the Northeast U.S. in the Marcellus and the Lower Huron, they were very uh, clay-rich formations, especially the Lower Huron. So we actually, any fresh water that we pumped in the well, we had to have clay stabilizer. Otherwise, the, uh, the water would soak into the clay, it would, and it would uh, soften the clay, and it would slough on you and create issues when you were trying to run your completion system. Uh, and then you have all sorts of different um, fluid loss additives, friction reducers, uh, surfactants, gel stabilizers, and some of these are going to be sure are, are going to be specific for the well. And some of them, like the breaker, the buffer, um, <clears throat> surfactants, uh, things like that will be specific to your uh, fluid system as well. So, for example, the uh, cross-link fluids, they, uh, they do require a very specific pH, depending on which cross-linker you're using. So you may have to have additional chemicals, depending on the fluid system. And the, uh, the final piece uh, here. So this is uh, pressure pumping uh, surface equipment. So this is uh, an image from frackfocus.org. Uh, and it, it does a pretty good job of laying out what you might see on a frack spread. So first off, we have the uh, pump trucks. So that's the hydraulic horsepower that we're going to use to pump that fluid and sand at the high rates and high pressures. We have our frack tanks and fluid storage up in the um, uh, upper part of the picture. And um, this is a, a little bit older picture from frackfocus.org. So I, I don't know for sure exactly which location they're on, but if you see a location like this, that's actually a relatively small amount of fluid storage uh, on location compared to what we pump in the well nowadays. So in a lot of cases, you're gonna have a large pit or a pond nearby that you can actually pump into those frack tanks and have a lot more storage uh, for the amount of fluid that you'll need to execute these jobs. We have the blender. So this is literally where all of the components and additives are, are blended together. So that's where you're going to blend your propens, your fluid systems and everything else. And then it'll uh, go to the wellhead. And, uh, and then you have your uh, frack control brand. So this is uh, the brain of the operation. So it really just depends on how new the frack fleet is as to how advanced they are. Uh, some of the newer ones, it, it kind of looks like playing a video game. Uh, very high tech, you can really and truly almost control everything from the van. And some of the older ones will really be a monitoring station and they use walkie talkies and people to, uh, to control most of everything on the frack job. Then you have your chemical trucks. So this will be um, where any of the additional added additives like friction reducers or any of the other chemicals, um, they pump from the chemical trucks to the blender. And then uh, your sand, sand storage units. So uh, like I said, this is a little bit older picture here. You can see here in the picture, the sand storage units. These are called, um, these are the horizontal versions here, uh, typically called sand kings in the US. And uh, they hold a lot of propens, but they also, you can see, they take up a lot of space on location 
because they're horizontal. So that's um, some of the, the newer technologies and techniques um, that is about space saving. So this is a vertical prop and silo. So this is Halliburton system here. You can see overall it's, it's uh, roughly the same size as the Sand Kings as far as volume. You can bring them out on a truck, but then when you get to location, you stand them up vertically and saving uh, space on location. And this is an image from Profrac here, and you can see the results here. They've got six, um, six prop and silos on location. And, you know, it's not necessarily an exact measurement, but it's, it's a pretty rough estimate here compared to the picture that we saw um, over here. We have three of the horizontal units, and now we have um, six of the vertical units taking up roughly about the same amount of space. So that's double the, roughly double the amount of propent in roughly the same amount of uh, space. So especially as we started pumping more and more uh, sand for these applications, the silos have become uh, very popular. And then you also have uh, sand boxes. So it's a little bit difficult to see here uh, in the bottom right hand screen, but these are uh, sand boxes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up this um, original photo so we can zoom in a little bit better and look at it. At Miriam, can you confirm that you can see this photo? Yeah, yes, we see it. Okay, perfect. All right, yeah, so, so what we have here is sandboxes. So you can see they're not near as big as the, the sand kings or the uh, silos, but they're a lot more compact and portable. So you can move them all with a forklift, you can stack them vertically as well, and then you can stack them on the belt um, and dump them uh, in line with the belt. So overall, um, the logistics uh, can be very, uh, can, can be improved so, significantly. Uh, Evan, excuse me, what, what, which picture you, you mean? The, the picture in the slide or something else? Uh, yeah, so, so the one, it's got a forklift right here, in the red forklift. The one that has a source uh, full frack at the bottom? Uh, no, uh, yeah, so I've zoomed in. So that, that's what I was asking. I wasn't sure, let me see. Or maybe you need to share a new screen. Yeah, let me, all right, here we go. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. So, so yeah, I was sharing a window. Can you see this picture now, me zooming yes. in on the red forklift? Yes. yes. Perfect, okay. All right, yeah, sorry, I'll explain that again. So, so these are the sandboxes here. You can see size-wise, they are a little bit smaller than the silos or the frack kings. Uh, or the same kings, but the, you can see that they're also able to move with just a forklift and they're also vertically stacked as well. So <clears throat> a lot of times with the logistics, uh, these can work out a lot better because you put them on the belts that go into the blender and then once they're empty, you can set them over to the side easily and they can be picked up by trucks and reloaded off location and then brought back out. So from a, um, a uh, dust perspective, as far as the silica dust, uh, you, you can see that it's right there on the belt. It doesn't have a long way to fall, so it's a little bit cleaner. And they're just easier to manage and move around on location. Now, these are uh, just some links here, some additional links that are uh, videos. Um, I believe we'll have the ability to distribute uh, the PDF through. If not, I'll be sure to um, send these links to Ahmed and uh, Miriam. So that you can see them, but they're overall just really good videos uh, available on YouTube that really talk about the overall process and, and does a, a really good job of the whole system and getting the fluids and propens uh, from their individual vehicles into the well bore. And here's some additional ones here. All right, so to, uh, to summarize the um, overall hydraulic fracturing propent selection, the type and size of the propent is going to be selected uh, based on the amount of forces that it's going to have to withstand in the formation and also the amount of conductivity that is required uh, to be able to produce at economical rates. So what we've actually seen, um, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, is uh, specifically to the U.S., when we first started developing these unconventionals, we thought that we needed a lot of force uh, with these propents. They needed to be able to withstand significant forces. In some cases, we thought, eight to 10,000 PSI or more. 
Uh, what we're currently doing, especially in the Permian, is we're using local sands that are typically anywhere from five to 8,000 PSI uh, strength. And at least, apparently, they're doing good enough. So, so we're, we're still learning a lot about these formation and, and what kind of closure stresses they have and what's actually required with these things. So it's still a work in progress, but you're going to make an educated guess on which propent based on what you estimate the forces are going to be. The propent volume and concentration, <clears throat> you're going to choose this based on the intended length and the width of the fracture. So this is going to be very, very dependent on what you're targeting with the frac job, what width you're going to have, what length you're going to have, because you, you don't want to have too much volume and concentration to where you create that screen out. Uh, your fluid system will then be chosen, and it's going to be uh, chosen based off the compatibility with your targeted reservoir and the capability to create the intended fracture and successfully transport the propane. So the fluid system is, is a very critical component because of its roles and responsibilities that it has in the frag job. And then of course your surface equipment, uh, at least um, in my opinion, ideally you want to uh, design these other three systems first and then pick your surface equipment because uh, you don't want to set up a job uh, and then not execute it, not be able to execute it because you did not bring out the correct surface equipment. So you decide the overall design of the frack job, how you're going to do it, the volumes of everything, and then you design, then you choose your surface equipment based on that frack design. Okay. So, uh, so to kind of close out today and, and lead into um, to next week, where we really start getting into the multi-stage completions, um, why are the multi-stage completions required in the first place? And it's because the fractures will grow to the path of least resistance. And we have leap paths of least resistance due to drilling stresses, drilling damage, and friction losses in the well. So um, because of all this, if we just run this type of well bore with no completion in it and we try to place one large frag down it, then we're going to end up in a scenario where um, typically we'll have most of the frag treatment going towards the heel because that's where you're going to have the drilling damage and the stresses because of the curve and also the friction losses because the fluid has the least amount of distance to travel towards the heel and it has to travel further to get out the toe. So the rest of the lateral will really get little to no treatment uh, in this scenario. And that's just, uh, you know, the certain things that we know about. The, the reality is we, we make an assumption that these formations are homogeneous but um, in reality, we know that they're not. And formation weaknesses will also create passive least resistance. So even if it does get by the curve, it will, if you try to place one large frack job down the well bore, then it'll end up going to the path of least resistance because of the formation weaknesses as well. <clears throat> and just to kind of give you a point of reference, um, in the US, when this was really started to develop these types of completions, the, this was actually attempted, one large frack job down a horizontal well. Uh, it's called a barefoot completion because you don't have any kind of completion system in the well bore. So after trying it several times, um, looking at production, there wasn't any significant, um, uh, there wasn't any increase in production. It actually was pretty comparable to vertical well production, but the horizontal wells were costing two to three times more than the vertical wells. So it was actually a complete waste of time to just drill a horizontal well and not isolate throughout that lateral. So that was the final key component to unlocking these types of reservoirs is dividing the well into co different compartments called stages. So instead of trying to place one large frag job, we divide it up into different stages and that way we're still going to have those paths of least resistance, but it's going to be the path of least resistant within that segment of the well, not the entire well bore. So we're forcing the fluid and the uh, surface area to grow by compartmentalizing uh, the well bore and dividing it up into stages. <clears throat> so there's been three uh, completion systems that we've proven to be the most effective and the most efficient in these types of plays. That's gonna be plug and perf, where we're using plugs and perforations to divert and isolate. Ball activated completion systems, where we're using frac sleeves to divert and isolate. And the cool tubing activated completion system, 
where we're using, uh, in some cases, sleeves, but we're going to use coil tubing to get the isolation and diversion needed for these reservoirs. So we're going to spend uh, uh, this Thursday, we'll be uh, plug and perf, we'll focus specifically on plug and perf. Then the following Tuesday, a week from today, we're going to talk about the ball activated and the coil tubing activated systems. So we're going to go into a lot of detail about what these systems are and how they work. So that's it for today. Um, for um, the end of day one, I will put my info back up here um, on the screen. So yeah, don't forget to check out uh, UOG.training and um, yeah, we'll open it up for uh, questions. Okay, so thank you, Engineer Burton, for this informative session. Uh, now we will begin by addressing the questions. So the first question states that uh, the gel breaker is added to the frac fluid from the beginning or after creating the fracs, we pump it. So it, it does depend. There are a few different types, but it, generally speaking, they are uh, blended uh, at surface and pumped into the well in, in more of the gel format. Um, there are some newer fluid systems out there that kind of, um, I guess you could say, um, continue gelling as it goes down the well bore. Uh, but generally, it, it's made up uh, at surface and pumped into the well bore. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is that, does fracturing uh, operation take takes place only offshore? It takes place offshore or only onshore? It's considered an only onshore so, uh, surface completion. So, so it definitely doesn't have to be an onshore surface completion. Um, it, it's, it's generally used there. And, and the reason, so let me back up a little bit. So fracturing is used offshore as well, but typically it's a little bit different fracturing objective than what we're looking at here. So in these unconventional reservoirs, we're, we're um, trying to get as much surface area as possible and we're trying to create artificial permeability. In other applications, it may be that we're doing matrix acidizing. So we're eating away some of the carbonates, but the, our, the uh, conductivity and the permeability is there if we do that. In other applications, uh, we're just trying to get past the drilling damage that we create because it's a very um, unconsolidated formation. So it just, the, the um, uh, what you call it, the, the wellbore wall, that's, that's not the correct terminology, but it, it kind of forms the cake around the wellbore when we drill it. So it's going to actually be a relatively small fracture compared to these types of reservoirs because we just have to get by that initial uh, wellbore wall damage. So, so there are uh, frac jobs that occur offshore for sure already, but, um, but it's just a little bit different objective with those frac jobs. Now, the, the other part to that is these types of formations are still available offshore. Uh, so for example, I've seen operators look at um, some of the ones that they're doing in US land, and it still continues in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's all about economics because these formations um, where we're creating artificial permeability, their production decline is very rapid. So, the, um, so it's just not, it's not economical for an offshore application if you drill a well, fracture a well, and a year later, the production has significantly declined. So if we can figure out a better way um, to get, or to get more production, uh, then it could go to offshore. And, and just to give you one more example, um, the, some of these systems that I used when I was still at Baker Hughes, some of these multi-stage completions were actually used in a conventional reservoir in the North Sea. So they were, they were doing the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, a little bit different objective. It wasn't near as big of a frac job, but they were able to use the technology from these onshore unconventionals, place it in their offshore application and significantly improve their uh, efficiency during the frac job. So overall, it was a win-win situation uh, for them. Okay, great, thank you. And the last question for today, how can we make sure that the selected propent uh, is the most optimum uh, choice uh, for the formation? Well, it, it all depends. Um, if you look at the US specifically, in a lot of cases, it was really kind of a, um, a cowboy approach, if you will, 
where they made some very off the cuff um, estimates and then uh, pumped it in the well bore and then adjusted accordingly. So they would estimate that they had a certain frac closure and uh, they would pump uh, a profit that let's just call it 10,000 PSI. Uh, and then, then they went to 8,000 PSI profit and then in the 6,000 and they waited until they saw a negative, um, a negative effect on the production to determine we need an 8,000 PSI profit. Um, theoretically anyway, you could do a lot more uh, science and experimenting up front and, and get better estimates. Um, but those are all not always correct either. And these formations are not homogeneous. So it really just, um, it's, it's kind of a guessing game either way. But I guess the best answer that I probably have for you is it's a lot of trial and error. Um, you, you make educated guesses the best you can based on the information you have and then adjust accordingly. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, now I want to remind you of some ground rules that will enable you to complete this course successfully and get your certificate, which, which uh, I'm sure by now most of you know. Uh, so first you have to join the, uh, the course's uh, Google Classroom. Uh, the codes are uh, mainly posted on the Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook uh, group. Uh, second, you have to fill the required personal information form with the same email you're going to use for the quizzes and the final exam. Uh, the final exam will be held at the end of this course and the date will be uh, posted on the Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook group. And please note that you shall join only one classroom. Otherwise, if you joined uh, two, you won't be able to get your certificate. And to highlight, this session has been recorded and it will be uploaded soon on Pio Petra's YouTube channel. So you may rewatch it and kindly subscribe to the YouTube channel Pio Petro and join the Facebook group and follow us on LinkedIn uh, to get our latest updates. Uh, now I wish you best of luck and thank you again, Engineer Barton, for your time. And that's all for today. Uh, have a nice day and see you in future webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam.